Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. Our course is on Substantive Criminal Law. Today we will be discussing Lesson 10. The title of the lesson is Sexual Offences, Criminal Force and Assault Against Women. In this lesson, we will be continuing forward from lesson 9 in which we discussed the offence of rape. What constitutes rape? What constitutes against the will of a woman? What is consent? In what cases consent is negated? And all these cases. Today, we will be continuing further and try to understand what amounts to gang rape how we are supposed to protect the rights of a rape victim and thereafter we will discuss other sexual offences that are committed against women that outrage her modesty in which criminal force is used against us such as offences of molestation, eve teasing, stalking, voyeurism, disrobing and sexual harassment. So first of all let us try and understand what amounts to gang rape. We have already discussed what amounts to rape. Now when those activities are done by more than one person that would amount to gang rape. But technically let us see what the law says about it. Section 70 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita defines what amounts to gang rape. It reads where a woman is raped by one or more persons constituting a group or acting in furtherance of a common intention, each of those persons shall be deemed to have committed the offence of rape and shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 20 years but which may extend to imprisonment for life which shall mean imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life and with fine. So students, what are the ingredients of gang rape? It says, first of all, there should be rape of a woman. Second, it should be committed by one or more persons. See, look at the usage of the term. It does not use the term man. It uses the term persons. Under the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, man has been defined as a male human being of any age. But here, the legislators have specifically chosen to use the term persons. What this implies is that the act can be committed by a man, a woman, a trans person. It can be committed by any person. Further, what does it say? Constituting a group. So, when there are more than one persons involved and when they are acting as a group, conjointly they are acting as a group or in furtherance of a common intention. Common intention implies prior concert. There has to be a prior meeting of minds. So what is required is now these two distinct things. Either there should be more than one person who share the common intention and then they rape that woman. Or second thing, even if they are not sharing the common intention, but they are acting in furtherance of a group. Now, why was this distinction very important? Because earlier what would happen that women would not be convicted for committing gang rape. The uh, justification behind that was that how can a woman have the intention to rape another woman? 
See, a woman might abet the rape of another woman, but because she herself was incapable of committing that act, because earlier the definition of rape was very narrow. When we talk about the law, before 2013, the definition of rape included only penile vaginal penetration. But after 2013, the definition of law was expanded to include all sorts of violations of a female's anatomy, whether it was done by a male organ, whether it was done by any object, by a stick, by a finger, by the mouth or by anything. So now when a woman's any of the bodily organs, they are manipulated by anything that would amount to the offence of rape. So now the definition also needed to be broadened of gang rape because earlier when women they could take this plea, let's see how can I have the intention to rape a woman because I am physiologically incapable of penetration. So that is why women would not be held guilty. But now the legislators, they have specifically one, expanded the ambit of the definition of the term rape. Second, they have introduced this term one or more persons constituting a group. So now there could be a group in which there are some men involved, there are some women involved and when they are acting as a group. See for all the group members prior meeting of minds or prior sharing of common intention is not required. Even if they are well aware of the common objective that would suffice. And objective is a broader term than common intention. Further, what does the law say? Each of those persons shall be deemed to have committed the offence of rape. Now, what it says when we use the term deemed, it means that there is a possibility that some persons might have committed rape some others might not have committed. Whatever the reasons might be, maybe the girl managed to escape before they could do it or whatever the reasons may be. But this is a deeming provision wherein what it says, see I will go through the language once again, it says where a woman is raped by one or more persons. Okay? When there are more or more than one person constituting a group and if they are acting either as a group or in furtherance of common intention, each of those persons shall be deemed to have. So irrespective of whether they could actually commit the rape or not, if she has been raped by only one person and there was a group of say four people, five people, seven people, uh, irrespective of how many people could actually rape her, by virtue of this term deemed, all of them would be equally guilty. What the law says, each of those persons shall be deemed to have committed the offence of rape and shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 20 years. See why the legislators have prescribed such a heavy punishment for this is because one, rape is a morally reprehensible crime, it is a very heinous crime against womanhood and second thing when people they act in a group. So what happens? People they draw strength from numbers. So when collectively they are engaging in such a heinous act, this is something which the law needs to curb and that to curb with a very strong arm and that is why the punishment that has been prescribed described as a minimum punishment of 20 years but which may extend to imprisonment for life and which shall mean imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life and with fine. So you see now there is a discretion with the judges depending upon the severity of the crime they will decide whether 20 years punishment would be sufficient or whether those persons they have to be sentenced for life imprisonment and life imprisonment which shall be interpreted as the remaining part of that person's natural life. Provided that such fine shall be just and reasonable to meet the medical expenses and rehabilitation of the victim provided further that any fine imposed under this subsection shall be paid to the victim. So under section 70 clause 1, there is also a provision of fine as a measure of punishment and the fine, the amount shall be determined depending on the harm that was caused to the victim and secondly on the capacity of the accused persons to pay. Taking all that into consideration, the court will arrive at an amount of fine so as to facilitate the medical expenses and rehabilitation also of the victim and the fine which ordinarily goes to the state shall in cases of rape, it shall be given to the 
victim so that she can meet her medical expenses she maybe needs to undergo some sort of a counseling after such a kind of a shock has a uh, such a kind of a heinous crime has happened against her so maybe she needs some sort of a counseling she needs time she needs a break from her work she needs medical treatment to come out of that so for, to facilitate all that that fine it shall be now paid to the victim section 70 clause 2 what it says is where a woman under 18 years of age is raped by one or more persons constituting a group or acting in furtherance of a common intention, each of those persons shall be deemed to have committed the offence of rape and shall be punished with imprisonment for life, which shall mean remainder imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life and with fine or with death. So, what happens in clause 2? Now, even a more stringent penalty has been prescribed in case the gang rape committed by more than one persons acting either as a group or in furtherance of common intention. But in cases where the victim is a woman below 18 years of age, then in such cases the offender will not be let off even after 20 years. Then in such cases the prescribed punishment is either imprisonment for life which shall be the remainder of that person's natural life or death. So, the legislators have also provided the provision for death penalty in case of gang rape of girls below 18 years of age. Again, and there is also a provision for fine and again the fine it shall go to the victim and the amount of fine will always be fixed keeping in mind so many considerations that we discussed like the paying capacity of accused, the harm that has been caused to the victim, how much treatment she requires, how much money she requires in order to rehabilitate herself. So, all these things will be considered by the court while determining an amount of money that has to be paid to the girl. Then. Gang rape is rape of a woman by more than one person forming a group of per people acting in furtherance of their common intention to commit rape on such woman. Common intention implies a prior meeting of minds that is an agreement whether express or implied. It could be by words, it could be by gestures, but it has to be there and common intention has to precede the event. See merely having same or similar intention is not sufficient. What is required is that there should be a prior meeting of minds and the meeting of minds should be there before the commission of the act, not subsequent to the commission of the act. So, a common knowledge which is acquired subsequent to the commission of the offence would not amount to common intention. So, common intention is to be construed in a very narrow way and that is why the legislators they introduce the term or acting in furtherance of the group because by virtue of this term common intention sometimes accused would take the easy way out. If prosecution floundered in proving the common intention of those who had not succeeded in committing the rape, then in such cases they could not be punished. But now the law has taken care of this. So, now even if you associate with rapists, you are found to be there, even if you are standing guard there and the rape was committed as a group. Some people committed the act, others were not committing the act, but others were still standing guard or others were waiting. Law says now everyone would be equally responsible and equally punishable. So, in cases of gang rape, every person forming a part of the group having common intention to commit rape would be held guilty irrespective of whether he commits the sexual act individually or not. In cases of gang rape, the proof of completed act of rape by each accused on the victim is not required. Why? Because the language that is used is shall be deemed to have committed the offence of rape. So, it is not at all required for the prosecution to establish beyond reasonable doubt that the victim was raped by each and every one of the accused persons. There is a leading case on this. In Bhupender Sharma versus State of Himachal Pradesh, a girl of 16 years was raped by four people and two more were waiting for their turn to rape her and were in the process of undressing for the same. In the meantime, the girl managed to give them a slip and ran away barefoot with minimum clothing on her person. 
the trial court awarded a sentence of seven years to those who had actually committed rape. See, this is a judgment which came much before 2013. Before 2013, gang rape was a punishable offence, but we did not have these enhanced punishments for the same. So that is why whatever was the punishment prescribed at that time was awarded by the trial court. So what the trial court did, it awarded a sentence of seven years to those who had actually committed rape, whereas the one who had not done the act was awarded a lesser sentence. Dealing with the question of different sentence, the Supreme Court observed, in cases of gang rape, the proof of completed act of rape by each accused on the victim is not required. In view of explanation 1 to section 376 clause 2 sub clause g which has now been substituted by section 376d in 2013 and recently section 70 in Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita 2023. So now it is not necessary that the prosecution should adduce clinching proof of a completed act of rape by each one of the accused on the victim or on each one of the victims where there are more than one in order to find the accused guilty of gang rape and convict them under section 376 IPC. Thus, in the absence of any just or special reasons for awarding a lesser sentence, the court would not be justified in awarding a sentence less than the prescribed minimum. So, this is how court addressed the issue of awarding separate sentences for all those who were guilty of gang rape. Punishment would be the same. Then, there is another judgment, Ashok Kumar versus State of Haryana what the court held? A measure of jointness in action and forming of a single group is essential. It was held by the Supreme Court in this case, in order to establish an offence under section 376 clause 2 sub clause g of the Indian Penal Code, now this was before 2013, read with explanation 1 there too, the prosecution must adduce evidence to indicate that more than one accused had acted in concert. And in such an event, if rape had been committed by even one, all the accused will be guilty irrespective of the fact that she had been raped by one or more of them. And it is not necessary for the prosecution to adduce evidence of a completed act of rape by each one of the accused. In other words, this provision embodies a principle of joint liability. And the essence of that liability is the existence of common intention. That common intention presupposes prior concert which may be determined from the conduct of offenders revealed during the course of action and it could arise and be formed suddenly, but there must be a meeting of minds. It is not enough to have the same intention independently of each of the offender. In such cases, there must be a criminal sharing marking out a certain measure of jointness in the commission of the offence. The person acting in a group in furtherance of their common intention is distinguishable from several persons coming with the similar intention of having sexual intercourse with a girl individually. They will not be acting in furtherance of common intention by group of persons as enjoined by explanation 1 to section 376. So, what was required earlier was a proof of common intention. But now what is required to be proven by the prosecution is either you establish common intention or if it can be proven that they were all acting as a group, then the liability of each one of them would be the same irrespective of the actual part which either of them plays in the act. Next, we come to punishment for repeat offenders. See, there are some people who never change. They commit an offence and then again they commit an offence. So what about such people? Do they deserve leniency or do they deserve a stricter punishment? So what the law says, 
whoever has been previously convicted of an offence punishable under section 64 or section 65 or section 66 or section 70 and is subsequently convicted of an offence punishable under any of the said sections shall be punished with imprisonment for life which shall mean imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life or with death. So, look at the language the legislature is very very clear because it says whoever has been previously convicted okay. if a person was previously apprehended and tried but if the person could not be convicted then in such cases we will not call such a person as a repeat offender. In order to come under the category of repeat offender what is required is that the person should have prior to the particular act in question should also have been earlier convicted by a court of competent jurisdiction on what charges either charges of rape or rape in certain cases or rape resulting in persistent vegetative state of victim or gang rape. So, the court is per, so the law is very very particular about these four categories of rapes in which cases what happens if a person who had been previously convicted of any of these categories of rapes. So, what they have excluded from this is custodial rapes or when we call about rape by a man on his separated wife. So, those two categories have been excluded, but except that all other categories of rape if a person has been on any previous occasion convicted of that offence and he again commits that act and is subsequently convicted of an offence again under any of these four that is either section 4 which convicts for rape 65 rape in certain cases or 66 which talks about brutal rape rape which results in the victim being in a vegetative state or in cases of gang rape then in such cases the courts will have no option but to punish the accused with imprisonment for life because look at the language it says shall be punished with imprisonment for life it does not give an option it does not give a discretion to the judges to award a lesser sentence otherwise what the legislators would have said they would have said shall be punished with imprisonment which may extend up to life imprisonment but now what does the law say shall be punished with imprisonment for life no discretion with the courts such a repeat offenders deserves a very extreme penalty under the law so such a person would be punished for imprisonment for life which shall mean the remainder of that person's natural life or with death so even death penalty may be awarded to such repeat offenders now coming to the right to privacy and dignity of rape, rape victims. See in our society it is very difficult for a woman to acknowledge that she has been raped. It is very unfortunate in our society that there is a stigma attached to the victim. See rape is committed by an accused person and we say that the woman has lost her honour. Now, it is a very serious question that I pose to all of you my dear students. What has the woman lost in case she has been raped? If there is any loser here it is the accused who has lost his honour and his dignity. It is the accused who has committed such a crime. Why do we put a stigma on the victim? Why should the victim hide her face? Why should the victim be ashamed of saying that something has happened to her, something which was so wrong, how could the accused have done it in the first place? But what happens? It is a very sorry state of affairs that when a woman goes to a police station, she is asked those questions, she is asked to relive that, relive that hor horror that she had encountered while she was being raped again during trial what happens the defense lawyers they put such questions to her which are more of an attempt to shame her more of an attempt that she would eventually backtrack from her version so that some kind of a doubt can be created in the minds of the court so that benefit of doubt can be given to the accused persons. So, when a woman she musters the courage to come and speak out for herself that see such an offence has been taken place against me and this is the accused person who needs to be punished. So, we all need to be very sensitive and we have to facilitate that this woman she is not exposed to any kind of a stigma 
owing to the offence which has taken place against her. See, whenever a woman is subjected to sexual harassment, whenever a woman is subjected to rape, it is not only a failure of the law and order machinery. It is a collective failure of the society because we failed to sensitize our sons. We failed to sensitize other people that see there is a concept of consent. That is something we have to be very, very mindful of when we tell our children what is rightful conduct, what is wrong conduct, what is acceptable behavior, what is not to be accepted in a society. So what is required is that we need to have a very sensitive approach. We need to sensitize our policemen, we need to sensitize our prosecution, our defense lawyers and the public at large so that a rape victim is seen as a woman with extraordinary courage who could at least call out the offense that was committed against her. What section 72 talks about is disclosure of identity of victim of certain offences. What it says, whoever prints or publishes the name or any matter which may make known the identity of any person against whom an offence under section 64 or section 65 or section 66, 67, 68, 69, section 70 or section 71. Now all these are sections dealing with offence of rape. So whoever prints or publishes the name or any matter which may make known the identity of any person against whom an offence of rape is alleged or found to have been committed hereafter in this section referred to as the victim shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to two years and shall also be liable to fine. This is to ensure that there is no stigma whatsoever on the rape victim and moreover in contemporary times there is a more progressive terminology which is being adopted and now we no longer refer to a rape victim as victim. Victim is being used for the legal purposes, otherwise we refer to such women as survivors. They are actually fighters, but here for the purposes of law we will be referring to them as victims because this is what the law also says in this section referred to as the victim. Then section 72 clause 2, nothing in subsection 1 extends to any printing or publication of the name or any matter which may make known the identity of the victim if such printing or publication is by or under the order in writing of the officer in charge of the police station or the police officer making the investigation into such offence acting in good faith for the purposes of such investigation. So you see if there is a legal authorization to print such a name of the victim then it is not actionable but then again what is required is that the police officer who is making the investigation into such offence should have acted in good faith and the disclosure should have been made only to facilitate the investigation. If it was for any other purposes, then even with the permission of the police officer making the investigation, the name of the victim cannot be disclosed. Then by or with the authorization in writing of the victim, so where the victim herself, she is open to her name being disclosed and third, where the victim is dead or a child or of unsound mind, then such people, one who is already dead or one who is a minor or one who is a person of unsound mind, they do not have the capacity to consent. Then in such cases, it does not mean that we can publish their names. We can publish their names, but only with the prior authorization of a person who has the capacity to grant consent in respect of such persons. So who is the person who has the capacity to grant consent in respect of a dead victim or in respect of a victim? who was a minor or a person of unsound mind. So it is the authorization in writing of the next of kin of the victim provided that no such authorization shall be given by the next of kin to anybody other than the chairman or the secretary by whatever name called of any recognized welfare institution or organization 
and for the purposes of this subsection, recognized welfare institution or organization means a social welfare institution or organization recognized in this behalf by either the central government or the state government, not to any private organization as it is. Now, coming to section 3, which deals with printing or publishing any matter relating to court proceedings without permission. Whoever prints or publishes any matter in relation to any proceeding before a court with respect to an offence referred to in section 72 without any previous permission of such court shall be punished with imprisonment for either description which may uh, uh, for a term which may extend to two years. So, it is a maximum imprisonment of two years and such a person shall also be liable to fine. The printing or publication of the judgment of any high court or the supreme court does not amount to an offence within the meaning of this section. Though the restriction does not relate to printing or publication of judgment by high court or supreme court, but keeping in view the social object of presenting social victimization or ostracisms of the victim of a sexual offence for which section 228A, now this is 228A of the old IPC which was there prior to the BNS has been enacted, it would be appropriate that in the judgments be it of the high court or lower court, the name of victim should not be indicated. So, now the judges they have to be mindful of this thing that when they are uh, dictating the judgments or when they are finalizing the judgments they have to take care that as far as practicable they should make efforts to not name the victim. The courts should as far as possible avoid disclosing the name of prosecutrix in their orders to save further embarrassment to the victims of sex crime. Sometimes the courts may lift the ban or printing or publication of trial proceedings in relation to an offence of rape subject to maintaining confidentiality of name and address of the parties. The anonymity of the victim of the crime must be maintained as far as possible throughout. So, all these directions they have been given bearing in mind the kind of stigma that is associated with a victim of sexual assault. Now, we will talk about sexual offences other than rape, which either insult or outrage the modesty of a woman. So, what are those sections? Let us talk about them. First of all, we will talk about section 79 that is word, gesture or act intended to insult modesty of a woman. Now, this is a provision which deals with an offence which was earlier dealt with under section 509 of the IPC and which in common parlance we refer to as Eve teasing. So, what does the provision read? Whoever, again it is a gender neutral crime to an extent in the sense that the perpetrator of the crime could be anyone. It does not specifically use the word whenever a man, it says whoever. So, it could be anyone. So, it says whoever intending to insult the modesty of a woman. So, what is required is firstly, whatever action is done, there should be an intention to insult the modesty of a woman. Now, modesty is something which is an integral part of womanhood. Every woman, irrespective of her age possesses a level of modesty that is capable of being outraged. So, you cannot say that it was a little child or it was an old woman, her modesty could not be outraged. No, it is very, very clear. It says modesty of any woman. So, there is no age restriction. So, let us not apply our own subjective considerations that oh, she is a infant, she is a girl or she is not yet a woman. No, it says woman. So, there is no age restriction whatsoever, but what should be the intention in doing whatsoever the acts they had have been mentioned hereafter, intention to insult the modesty of a woman. Now, what are the acts that have been prohibited? Utters any words, makes any sound or gestures, exhibits any object in any form, 
intending that such word or sound shall be heard or that such gesture or object shall be seen by such woman or intrudes upon the privacy of such woman shall be punished with simple imprisonment for a term which may extend to three years and also with fine. So, what is punishable under section 79 is whenever any person tries to outrage the modesty of a woman by any words, acts or gestures, but when it, this is all done from a distance that is if you are calling out names, if you are using any obscene language, you are singing any objectionable song or saying any such statement which is offensive to the modesty of a woman, flashing any obscene object at her, flashing your body parts at her, if you are doing any of such things with an intention that such an act or such a sound might be seen or heard by her and then this is being done with an intention to outrage her modesty, then in such cases the liability of the accused would be under section 79 for which act the per accused may be punished with imprisonment which would be simple in nature for a term that may extend up to three years. So, there is a discretion with the judge, but the maximum punishment that is awarded uh, awardable under this section is three years and there is also a provision for fine. Next we come to section 74, which deals with assault or use of criminal force to woman with intent to outrage her modesty. So, section 74 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita deals with the offence of molestation which was earlier dealt with under section 354 of the Indian Penal Code. So, what does it say? Whoever, again it is partially gender neutral in the sense that it could be a man, it could be a woman who can be held guilty of molestation. It does not use the term only man, but the victim can only be a woman. Like in previous section also when we talked about section 79, similarly in section 74, now these are specific offences, these are specific crimes which are targeted only against women. So, that is why the protection that is granted is only to women. It has been cited in the title itself because it says assault or criminal force to woman with intent to outrage her modesty implying that the victim can only be a woman, but the perpetrator can be anyone and that is why it says whoever assaults, assaults is threateningly move towards a person or uses criminal force to a woman. That is when you threateningly assault a person and thereafter if you actually come in contact with the person, if you touch a woman, you grope a woman, you push a woman, you press her any body part, it could be any way whoever assaults or uses criminal force to any woman intending to outrage or knowing it to be likely that he will thereby outrage her modesty. See this is a section which talks about both intention or knowledge. Sometimes an accused might take the plea that I did not intend to outrage her modesty. See you do such an act and then you want to take the plea that I did not intend, but did you know now, unless and until you are a person of unsound mind, how can you deny knowledge? So, the law can safely presume that if you touch a woman inappropriately, even if you do not have any wrong intentions, you ought to know that it is something which would be offensive to the modesty of a woman. And that is why the law has used both these terms intention as well as knowledge. So, what the law says? intending to outrage or knowing it to be likely that he will thereby outrage her modesty shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not be less than one year, but which may extend to five years and shall also be liable to fine. So, here you see in cases of molestation, there is a minimum punishment of one year and it may extend up to five years. In cases of eve teasing, there was no minimum punishment, but the maximum prescribed was three years. But see what is the difference between eve teasing and molestation? Eve teasing takes place from a distance. Molestation is when you have touched the woman with such wrong intention, touched her in a way so as to feel her outraged. So, in such cases, the gravity of the offence is more and that is why the punishment that has been prescribed is also no one can be let off with a punishment which would be less than one year and then it can go up to five years and also with fine. Next we come 
to the definition of the crime of sexual harassment. See sexual harassment before the introduction of section 75 in the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, it was introduced as a crime by virtue of section 354A in the Indian Penal Code. This happened in 2013. Before that sexual harassment was not treated as a specific crime although we at that time also had these charges of eve teasing and molestation and those were the provisions with the help of which the super cop of Punjab DGP KPS Gill who was convicted of outraging the modesty of a senior bureaucrat uh, who was Madam Rupam Deol Bajaj. Now that was a case that was very much in the media and it was highlighted because it was a case in which the message was out loud and clear for everyone to see that no matter how highly placed you are, how mighty and powerful you are, if you do any act which is derogatory to womanhood, the law is not going to spare you. So, in that case also, it took more than 17 years for that uh, lady Rupam Deol Bajaj to eventually get justice, but finally KPS Gill was convicted with the help of then section 354 and section 509. But at that time, we did not have a specific provision of sexual harassment, otherwise that have would, would have been uh, used in place of those two sections. In 2013, we introduced sexual harassment as a crime. Prior to that, sexual harassment was treated only as a civil offence and that too under Vishakha guidelines. So, one month after we got this sexual harassment as a crime under 354A of IPC, then we also got the POSH Act, which is the civil law that protects uh, women, working women against sexual harassment at the workplace. But there is a difference between these two laws, between the scope and application of these two laws because the civil law protects women against sexual harassment only at the workplace. Whereas the criminal law on sexual harassment, it protects women against sexual harassment at the workplace and at any other place also. So, if a woman alleges sexual harassment at the workplace, she has the option to register a case with the internal committee of the organization where she is working or with the local committee of her district. Additionally, what she can do is she can also file an FIR under section 75 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita for criminal action against the offender. So, what does section 75 say? It defines what is sexual harassment. Now, here look at the language. It says a man committing any of the following acts. So, here the legislators have specifically chosen the term man instead of the term person. What this implies is that sexual harassment can be committed only by a man. It cannot be committed by a woman or any other person. Whereas, when we talk about the civil law, that law is clear that who is protected is only women. But who can be the perpetrator? It could be a man, woman, trans person, it could be anyone under the civil law. But under criminal law, who is protected is a man as well as a woman. Yes, you heard me right. The crime of sexual harassment, it acknowledges that even men can be subjected to the crime of sexual harassment. But we are partially gender specific in the sense that we have not acknowledged yet that even a woman can be guilty of sexually harassing a man. So, according to the law, it is only a man who can be held guilty of sexual harassment, whereas the victim of sexual harassment could be either a man, it could be a woman, it could be anyone. So, what the law says, a man committing any of the following acts, one, physical contact and advances involving unwelcome and explicit sexual overtures. So, here what is important is the term unwelcome. See, whatever the behavior may, may be, it might be a sexual act, it might be any kind of an act. If it is welcome, if it is mutual, if it is reciprocated, then the law has no problem. The law will not intervene unless and until there is either a minor involved or there is a lack of consent. But in other cases, in cases of consenting adults, the law will not intervene. The law in cases of sound adults intervenes only when such behavior is unwelcome, unsolicited, unreciprocated. So, what is required to prove sexual harassment is 
there should be either a physical contact or it could be physical advances. It could be from a distance, it could be by actual physical touch, but it should involve unwelcome and explicit sexual overtures. See, not every kind of overture would be a sexual overtures. Anything which is targeted against a woman or against a man with that alludes to the sexuality of that person would only amount to a sexual overture. Second would be a demand or request for sexual favors. See, when we talk about the offense of sexual harassment, we use a Latin term to explain it. It is quid pro quo. That means this for that. This is a Latin term. How does it operate in the context of sexual harassment? That is when an accused he uh, promises a woman or a man that see I am going to give you a promotion or maybe some sort of a preferential treatment or maybe some other advantage if you give sexual favors to me. So that is a quid pro quo situation, this for that. Alternatively, if you threaten someone that in case you do not provide me sexual favors, you will be harmed in one way or the other way in any kind if you have threatened a person. Okay. That is also a quid pro quo situation. So, what is required is that there should be a demand or request for sexual favors, but how we understand this demand or request in a quid pro quo situation. Then showing pornography against the will of a woman. Now, this is one clause which is very, very specific because it is specifically mentioning the term woman. What this implies it? If you are sending a pornographic clip, if you are sending any objectionable obscene material to a woman, even on phone, even on social media, if you are sharing it with her, you have shared it on social media and you have tagged her with an intention that she may see it. So if that is all done against a woman, it amounts to sexual harassment. But what if such an act is done against a man? The law has conveniently sidestepped it. The law does not talk about it. So this is clause 3 of clause 1 of section 75 is gender specific in the sense that it is talking only when it is applicable only when pornography is shown to a woman against her will. Again what is important is against her will. If she is willing to see it there is no problem. The problem is lack of willingness on the woman. Then fourth is making sexually colored remarks shall be guilty of the offense of sexual harassment. So you see there is a very broad definition of what amounts to sexual harassment and except clause 3, all other are gender neutral in application, but the accused can only be a man. Then any man who commits the offence specified in clause 1, 2 or 3 of subsection 1 shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to 3 years or with fine or with both. So, there is no minimum punishment prescribed, but the maximum is 3 years and that too of rigorous imprisonment. See, whenever the lawmakers use rigorous imprisonment, it means this is indicative of the fact that this is a serious punishment for which uh, this is a serious offense for which there is a more severe kind of punishment that has been prescribed. In simple offenses, it could be simple imprisonment. It is in grave offenses that the legislators have not given the option to the judges and they are now directed to give only rigorous imprisonment. Then any man who commits the offense specified in clause 4 of subsection 1, clause 4 is making sexually colored remarks. So, such person shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to one year or with fine or with both. So, if there is the charge of making sexually colored remarks that is considered as a slightly less serious offense for which the punishment could be simple uh, imprisonment also, there is a discretion with the judges because what the legislature says is imprisonment of either description. It, it could be simple, it could be rigorous, but the maximum term of imprisonment would be one year. Next is section 76. Section 76 talks about the offense of disrobing. Now, it is so unfortunate that even in today's times we are talking about offenses such as disrobing, but what is even more unfortunate is that these crimes are actually happening. 
women they are hunted down they are branded as witches they are paraded naked they are disrobed in order to make her feel a sense of shame and whoever assaults a woman or whoever uses a criminal force against a woman with intention to disrobe before 2013 it was not recognized as a distinct crime but now after 2013 we initially put it in the IPC as 354B and now under the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita as section 76. What does the law say? Whoever assaults or uses criminal force to any woman or abets such act with the intention of disrobing or compelling her to be naked shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not be less than three years but which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine. So when you read the language of 76 carefully you see that this also penalizes abetment of disrobing because it is talking about whoever assaults or uses criminal force on a woman or abet such act. See what happens, offences of disrobing are usually committed by people in groups. So people they draw strength from numbers. If such a person was alone he would not have the guts to do that act. But when there are other people who are instigating him, who are aiding him, who are helping him in that kind of an act, who are encouraging him to go ahead with his uh, bad intentions, then in such cases all of those who were present at the scene of crime and who were abetting such an act, they would all be held guilty of uh, disrobing. What is required is that there should be any kind of an assault or criminal force, it should be committed against a woman. Here the victim of disrobing can be only a woman but the accused could be whoever, it could be a man, woman, trans person, it could be anyone who was constituting that group and who had the intention to use such assault or criminal force on a woman to compel her, to shed her clothes or even if they have torn her clothes, whatever they have done but if it was done with the intention of disrobe her, put her to shame, now that would amount to a crime of disrobing for which the punishment shall be not less than three years. There is a minimum punishment of three years for such a crime and it may extend up to seven years and shall also be liable to fine and again what it talks about is imprisonment of either description. For, so now for the offence of disrobing an accused can be punished with rigorous imprisonment of seven years also. Next we talk about voyeurism. Now the term voyeurism has been derived from the French term voyeur which means peeping tom. Okay, sometimes people they have some sort of a tendencies that they like to watch, observe or record people who are engaged in their private act. So peeping tom if somebody is looking through a keyhole, somebody is looking through a crack in the door or somebody is just trying to observe somebody by maybe hiding cameras somewhere in changing rooms, in toilets, whatever. So such kind of tendencies they need to be curbed. See voyeurism in many countries it is also dealt with as a psychosexual disorder. Okay. But then in a civilized society if we categorize these kind of crimes as mere psychosexual disorders for which a person needs to be treated and not to be punished, what happens that people they might try to take this as a pretext for commission of crimes. So in a civilized society the quirks of some people it cannot be allowed to outweigh the interests of majority of people and that is why voyeurism has been categorized as a crime. It was categorized as a crime earlier under IPC in the year 2013 as section 354C and now it has been reintroduced in BNS as voyeurism as section 77. What does the law say? Whoever watches or captures the image of a woman engaging in a private act in circumstances where she would usually have the expectation of not being observed either by the perpetrator or by any other person at the behest of the perpetrator or disseminate such image. So what is required is that the accused should either capture the image, take a photograph, record a video or 
the what the accused can do is disseminate such image maybe it was recorded by someone else but if the perpetrator disseminate such image shall be punished on first conviction with imprisonment for either description for a term which shall not be less than one year but which may extend up to three years and shall also be liable to fine. And in case of second or subsequent conviction, the imprison may be, imprisonment may be of either description for a term which shall not be less than three years, but which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine. So, for the purpose of this section, private act includes an act of watching carried out in a place where in the circumstances the person would reasonably be expected to provide privacy and where the victim's genitals, posterior or breasts are exposed or covered only in underwear or the victim is using a lavatory or the victim is doing a sexual act, an act that of a kind which is not ordinarily done in public. An explanation two, where the victim consents to the capture of the images of any act but not to their dissemination to third persons. Sometimes what happens there is a young couple in love, they might be recording their uh, nudes or they might be recording their private acts, but so where the woman she has consented to the recording of such images, but she has not consented to their dissemination in public. Then in such cases where such image or act is disseminated, such dissemination shall be considered an offence under this section. Now, section 78 talks about stalking. What it says again, it is a gender specific uh, a crime in the sense that it can be committed only by a man because the legislators they have retained the term man and how does BNS define the term man is a male human being of any age. So, what does the law say? Any man who follows a woman and contacts or attempts to contact such woman to foster personal interaction repeatedly despite a clear indication of disinterest by such woman. That is the woman she is not interested and she has indicated her disinterest clearly. It could be by words, by gestures, by expressions whatsoever and the man still does not take the hint. The man is still trying to contact such woman to foster a personal interaction or if when a man monitors the use by a woman of the internet, email or any other form of electronic communication. So, here what is clear is it is not only physical stalking, but also cyber stalking. See after the pandemic there has been an increase in the use of the internet and there is an anonymity which is provided online. So, cases of cyber stalking they have grown many fold. So, what this provision deals with is the act of physical stalking as well as the act of online stalking provided such conduct shall not amount to stalking, but there are certain provisos wherein a protection has been granted that is if the man who pursued it proves that it was pursued for the purpose of preventing or detecting crime and the man accused of stalking had been entrusted with the responsibility of prevention and detection of crime by the state or it was pursued under any law or to comply with any condition or requirement imposed by any person under any law or in the particular circumstances such conduct was reasonable and justified. Whoever commits the offence of stalking shall be punished on first conviction with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to three years and shall also be liable to fine and be punished on a second or subsequent conviction with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to five years and shall also be liable to fine. So, students in this lesson we discussed about what amounts to gang rape what is disrobing, what is voyeurism, what is sexual harassment, what is e teasing, molestation and finally what is stalking. In the next session, lesson 11, we will be talking about the offences or the crimes that women are subjected to within the matrimonial relationships. I hope you are enjoying the lessons as much as I am enjoying delivering these lessons to you. Stay with me. Thank you, that will be all for today.